Okay, everyone. Our next guest has come all the way from LA to join us today. There are plenty of uh, things we consider human, which in fact also belong to the animal kingdom. Dogs can get cancer, rats can develop addictions, and birds can catch the flu. So medical conditions are by no means limited to humans. But how about psychological disorders? Can, for instance, a uh, dog have OCD or a cat become depressed? Such are the questions addressed in the book Subiguity by Catherine Bowers and Barbara Natterson. Today, we have Catherine here. Please welcome her, everyone. Vær <laughs> Can we go out? Can Karen come out? So that is the extent of my Norwegian at this point. And uh, thankfully for all of us, you can speak English. Um, I'm going to continue on in English now. And, um, but I do want to say that I'm very, very happy to be here. I was so pleased to be invited. And um, my love of Norway, Norwegians, and Norwegian culture goes very, very deep. I lived here when I was four years old till six. I learned um, Norwegian and Norway sort of as I was learning my own American culture. And um, I think those kinds of early experiences go very far and uh, kind of create who we become psychologically and perhaps even physically. Um, I am a journalist and a writer. I'm not a practicing psychiatrist or psychologist. But my expertise has led me uh, to an interesting area of comparative study. I look at the vast and vastly underrecognized overlaps between animal and human health, and particularly between the shared neurobiology and the environments that underlie behavior. So what I'd like to start with today is an exercise and a challenge. I'd like for you to watch this video. This is a shoal of a kind of fish called a herring scad, or a jackfish. These form huge schools, and they're found all over the Western Pacific. These particular ones are swimming in the region of the Solomon Islands. And what I'd like for you to try to do is choose one fish and follow it for as long as you can. It's a little bit hard because some of them swim out of frame, and then the video will start again. But see if you can choose just one and see how long you can follow it without getting distracted by the rest of the group or the pattern that the whole group is making. And as you're watching, start asking yourself, how old is this animal? Is it male? Is it female? Is it hungry? What time of year do you think it is? What time of day is it? What is that one fish's relationship with the fish above it, below it, beside it, all around it? And then what is that fish's affect? Is it frightened? Is that fish calm, activated, aroused, sleepy? Is it sort of just on autopilot? And now, try it with these trumpeter swans. This will be a little bit easier because they're bigger and they're in slow motion, and that top one flies out of frame for a minute, so maybe don't choose it. But try to choose one of these animals, and then ask yourself, again, those same questions. Is that animal male, female? Is it hungry? What time of year is this? What time of day? What is that animal's relationship with the birds around it? Again, what is its affect? Is it frightened? Is it flying from something? Is it calm, sleepy, alert? So as human beings, we are surrounded all the time by animal groups, flocks, herds, schools of fish, insects, birds, other mammals. I don't know about you, but something that happens to me is that I often look at these animals as groups of clones. They all look the same. They look pretty much like they're all doing the same thing. They look like they have some sort of um, almost robot-like 
uh, relationship with one another. But the truth is, animal groups are not groups of clones. They are groups of individuals, just like individual people. Every fish in a school, every reindeer in a herd is a singular, absolutely unique individual with a certain personality and psychological profile. For example, every one of the 10,000 starlings swooping around in mesmerizing cloud formations differs from every other individual in that group through its age, gender, experience, health status, coordination, its cognitive ability, each bird's cognitive ability is slightly different, its reproductive sex success, if it's had reproductive success that day or that week or that year, its pedigree, and who its parents are. They are older and younger, healthier and sicker, faster and slower, and all of these animals are more or less anxious. And they don't all have the same opportunities either. There are high status and low status animals in any animal group. Even within the same flock, herd, or school, each of those individuals occupy different places in the hierarchy of that group. And what that means is for social animals, almost every single minute of every single day, when they are in contact with other members of their group, they're determining where they stand with everyone else in that group. So I'll get back to status and hierarchy in a second, but first let's talk for a minute about personality. So take these puppies. From the moment they're born, puppies have personalities. Anyone who's had a puppy or raised puppies or any other kind of animal knows that that's true, even though we don't often think of animals as having personalities. We could call them animalities, I guess, if we wanted to be a little bit more grammatical about it. Um, but these puppies, the minute they're born, they come out and they're different. Some are shyer, some are bolder, some are um, more interested in novelty, some are, are more observers. Uh, and this personality has a lot of um, things behind it, including um, a huge genetic component. But one part of it is, um, starts in the uterine environment, even when they're growing as um, tiny fetus puppies. Uh, where they are in their mother's womb makes a difference for what their personality will turn out to be. For example, if a male puppy gestates between two girl puppies, he can become more estrogenized. And the same thing, a girl puppy can gestate next to a boy puppy and be more testosteroneized and be more aggressive when she's born. That has been seen in lots of other animals, including cattle. Uh, even just a few years ago, you were sort of laughed at and called an anthropomorphizer if you talked about animal personality at all. But more and more biologists are starting to look at the idea that puppies, buffaloes, foxes, sardines, cockroaches, um, even mosquitoes and fruit flies have what you could call personality. Those are uh, consistent behavioral traits over time. Uh, animal experts tend to talk about them pretty much in two categories, bold and timid, although there's, there's other categories too, reactive and proactive. Um, but it's a little bit like the way we might talk about introverts or extroverts in human populations. Uh, some of this research is actually, I th think, producing counterintuitive results. For example, there's a biologist at UC Davis who's studying this animal, which is called a water strider. They're little insects that you see on the tops of ponds. They look like they're walking on water. And what he's found is that some of them are, again, more extroverted and bold, and some of them are more introverted and timid. And he was studying who among those water striders were the ones that would form new colonies. When, when a space would get overrun and they would need to find a new territory, who would go out and do that? He thought it was going to be the bold ones who were not afraid to go out and explore new areas, but it turned out it was the, the timid, shyer, more introverted water striders that colonized new areas because they got sort of fed up with the social life around them and kind of just wanted to be alone a little bit, not to anthropomorphize, and off they went and formed new colonies. So, um, so animals have personalities. All social animals are individuals and at the same time they're group members. I think that's a really important thing to always remember is that as you're working with an individual, he or she is also always, always part of a group, including you. If there's two people in a room, there is a relationship between um, the client and the psychologist. Uh, and that is actually, that can be a lot of pressure for animals because you have to be very good at switching back and forth between being an individual and being part of a group. Um, I like to think of 
um, animals as having all these different things, and you see them again as one big group, but actually all of these many, many other things are going on as animals are, um, are in, in their environment, um, either calm or in flight, and also um, the same thing with human beings. Luckily, humans are not the first social creatures on Earth. Our social, our social intelligence is the inherited accumulation of hundreds of millions of years of group living among other species on, on our planet. So for 500 million years, fish have been evolving on our planet. For 400 million years, insects have been around. 300 million years, reptiles. 200 million years ago, mammals began to emerge. Again, as our um, we have these shared common ancestors in the uh, animals that came before. And 150 million years ago were birds. So these ancient animal ancestors of ours have been living in groups for 500 million years, developing these emotional systems which are motivating and regulating, encouraging us to live in groups, and also helping us figure out how to live in groups peacefully. And one of the most effective ways of controlling, regulating, modulating group living is social anxiety. Um, group living probably came about to protect animals. Animals living in groups tend to be safer from outside predators. Uh, they then, once you're safer from outside predators, group living can bring other benefits like shared hunting, um, physical benefits like warmth, there can be more food, and then there's all the social benefits that come from living in groups to um, shared grooming, shared understanding, collaboration, community. But there's also a certain amount of conflict and competition that happens in groups. And what keeps the peace in animal groups is an astoundingly deep-seated, inborn and species-wide ability to figure out where you fit in. There's an animal behaviorist in the U.S. named Mark Beckoff, and he knows a lot about how animals work out their places within their groups. And he describes it like this. He says, we social animals are hardwired to sort ourselves into hierarchies at which someone is at the top and someone is at the bottom and the rest of the group is arrayed between those two points. He says it's an almost telepathic ability that animals from water striders to fish to human beings have to understand how that works. That is at once um, astonishing, I think, especially in societies that believe that people are created equal and that societies that strive for that. Um, but it's also, I imagine, something that we've all experienced and we've all felt. Uh, I've tried to use this knowledge when I've walked into cocktail parties before and been confronted by a whole room full of people and think, um, do we all just form a linear hierarchy? Is my relationship with everybody in this room either above or below me and uh, an arrayed. And it doesn't always work out exactly that way because of course human personality is very, very complex. But it is interesting to know that feeling of figuring out where you fit in and the comfort when you're in a place where you know that you fit. Um, so I'll just let you watch these fish while we talk about how hierarchies form for a second. Um, again, hierarchies are seen very systematically across a range of species, and the way that animals size each other up to form these hierarchies fall into two main categories. There's the category of things that you're born with, that you can't do anything about, um, that are essentially unearned, we could call it unearned privilege, actually, um, and then there's a set of things that are a little bit more active, a little bit more behavioral, a little bit more uh, in your control, and we could call that earned privilege. Those earned privileges are much easier to get if you already have a huge stock of the unearned privileges. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, one of the things that you're just born with that animals um, use to literally size each other up is size. Um, Generally, bigger animals are higher in the hierarchy, although that's not at all necessarily completely true in every situation. Um, and it's a little bit even less true for uh, females than for males. Your age is another one of these um, categorizing things. Older animals tend to be more dominant up to a certain point, which is interesting for uh, people who are going to be working with adolescents and children because um, Navigating that hierarchy with a client is um, kind of an important part of what you do, and knowing that it's biologically already there might influence the way that you work with the, that um, 
population. Gender and sex can also um, play a role in, in how hierarchies get sorted out. Um, again, it's not always that males are uh, more dominant in hierarchies, but if you remove males, females form hierarchies in different ways than when the males are there, and bachelor groups of males form their own hierarchies in ways that are different when it's a mixed group. Um, and then also when there's diverse gender orientation, um, that affects it as well. Um, and then this, th this last section of these sort of inherited um, hierarchical um, judging mechanisms, uh, I found fascinating and again, hiding in plain sight. So uh, slightly obvious, but um, also really interesting to think about. And that is the influence of your parents. Um, some animals are born into uh, advantage that other animals just don't have just because of who their parents are. So the cubs of high ranking spotted African hyenas will enjoy higher status than other cubs ha with different parents and high status canary mothers, for example, anoint their eggs with more testosterone and then their chicks are born with inherited high status because of that extra aggressive quality. Um, again, maternal inheritance is um, something in a society where we want to think of ourselves as being um, kind of born on a level playing field. It's hard to think about, but it's actually true. And I think if we realize that it has biological underpinnings, it can help us form societies that are um, more equal and that we can make sure we're taking care of everybody along this, the spectrum. Um, so I'll let you look at these birds again while we talk about the, um, the hierarchy determining mechanisms that are a little bit more in an animal's control. So one thing that some animals do in order to move up the hierarchies is to associate with higher status animals. So you might see in a milking line, for example, of cows, you might see lower status animals associating with higher status animals in order to get more status themselves. Um, something else animals do is they can leave the group and then come back later. And often leaving for enough time gives the, um, gives the hierarchy enough time to reconfigure and they can come back in a different position. This is something else is that hierarchies among animals are not static. They are constantly changing. They're dynamic, moving objects. So uh, animals, including human animals, that are sorted into sort of lower categories have ways of emerging into um, some of the higher categories. and. Um, you don't have to occupy the same place in every group you're in, which I think argues for being in as many groups as possible. Um, so an another, th another thing that animals use to judge each other to immediately in this sort of telepathic way size each other up is health and appearance. Um, this appearance of good health. Animals, will, um, animals that appear to be sickly are often kind of pushed to the side and animals that appear to have good health, even if it's not necessarily true, even if it's a um, set of feathers or a, something on their head that makes them look healthier, that's called a status badge, that can, um, that can give them a stronger position in the, in the community. Um, there's also something called dominance displays, which is where a dominant animal will aggress on lower status animals. And uh, I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about human bullying. For a long time, bullying was sort of seen as um, someone who didn't have much power trying to get power. But when you look at the animal world, those kinds of dominance displays are much, much more often done by um, a, an aggressor onto a subordinate. And uh, that might help us think about different ways of thinking about how bullying works and what we can do about that. Um, and then there's another, um, Another category called um, experience, skill, you could call it knowledge. It's just um, having experience in interacting with other animals gives you the experience to, um, to be higher up in the, in the hierarchy the next time around. Um, so instead of thinking of social anxiety, um, this constant figuring out where you are, as pathological and maladaptive, which of course it sometimes can be, especially when it's dialed up, I think it can be very useful to think of it more as being adaptive to animals living in groups that are organized into hierarchies. Again, it helps us draw on this 500 million years of experience living as social animals. So again, hierarchies exist to maintain cohesion 
and communication, collaboration among groups of animals. And one way that this happens for a, for a group of animals to be do, doing something like what these starlings is doing is to inhibit the animals in the middle or lower ranges through mechanisms like anxiety or maybe even depression. That will prevent them from challenging the leadership and it keeps the group working together. Uh, under this hypothesis then, human anxiety is triggered by situations where an individual might feel trapped or feels like they've been sorted into the wrong place or they feel voiceless. Um, and again, to us as modern humans, that feels pathological, but it does represent an activation of these ancient pathways that evolved to keep us safe. So while they, um, they might manifest themselves in ways that aren't always healthy in 2015 human society, they are an essential part of our biology. And as modern psychologists, I think it's useful to keep that in mind as we think about ways of um, helping helping people live on their own and in groups. So that is the general background. Um, what I believe and wrote about in my book is that animals have personalities, that social grouping has been in evolving in animals for at least 500 million years and maybe even longer, that groups are protective and beneficial and wonderful and part of our evolutionary heritage, but they can also be dangerous places for animals, individuals, and so hierarchies emerge to keep those groups together to make group living safer, safer, but the tools of that evolution, the tools of that cohesion, can sometimes have difficult modern day side effects in anxiety and depression. Um, my, my book's ubiquity encourages human doctors to look at their patients as animal patients, human animal patients. And uh, that meant that I talked to a lot of veterinarians about how they work with their, um, their clients and their patients, their animal patients, and then the human beings who take care of, their, of the animals um, they call clients. Uh, and I learned that veterinarians have a joke. Um, they say, what do you call a veterinarian who takes care of only one species? A physician. So the, the idea is that um, vets have to be pediatricians and geriatricians and adolescent medicine doctors. They have to be oncologists and surgeons. They really have to know how to do it all. And physicians often specialize in one little thing um, and including one, one species because vets have to work on um, birds and reptiles and mammals and sometimes even um, depending on their on their practice, uh, exotic insects. Um, so let me give you a taste of some of the uh, possibilities of the species-spanning approach that I talk about in my book. Um, one area is uh, self-harm, which I link to uh, an evolutionary urge to groom. Um, psychologists, at least in the United States, and I'm, I think internationally also, are saying that they're seeing an increase in self-harming behaviors, also called cutting. Um, and I was fascinated to learn that there are birds that under certain circumstances will compulsively pluck out their own feathers, very much like human trichotillomaniacs who um, pluck out their own hair. Sometimes it's their eyelashes or the hair on their head. Um, and it can be quite damaging. This is a picture of a bird that's plucked out its own feathers. It looks like the other bird did it, but this is actually an attempt to um, bring this bird a companion to take the pressure off of being alone to help it stop feather plucking. Um, this is a human patient who had trichotillomania where he was picking out his own hair and an African gray parrot next to him who had a similar feather plucking disorder. Um, there are stallions who can develop uh, flank biting disorder where they nip and bite at their own flanks and then keep biting and biting, um, inflicting injury on themselves. Dogs and cats can get something called acrolick dermatitis, where they lick and lick and lick at their own paw, and it has nothing to do with mites or fleas or any other sort of allergy. Um, it has its psychogenic in origin. Um, veterinarians actually call it, when they see it in cats, over-grooming, and um, it looks a lot like human self-injury, uh, and it can be very, very upsetting to the animal itself and to the person who's taking care of them. What's interesting is that these activities often take the form of cleaning activities. So it would be a, a cat licking its paw or a horse biting its flank or the birds plucking out their feathers with their 
with their beak. Um, and the reason I link it to grooming is that grooming is one of the ways that animals have of self-soothing during the course of a day. I mean, many of us might find ourselves doing small self-soothing things during the day, brushing a cheek or pulling your hair or, or brushing the, the tactile repetitive motion can keep an animal calm. It releases endorphins. There's, a, um, there's sort of a mirror neuron thing that can happen in groups of people when grooming is going on. And grooming is one of these things that animal groups use to keep the peace. And it's a potent self-soother as well. But when an animal gets under more and more and more stress and it tries to groom itself more and more and more, and that, um, that urge to groom gets dialed way, way up, they can end up harming themselves in ways they didn't mean to, all in an attempt to soothe themselves. Now, veterinarians have strategies for dealing with these kinds of behaviors in animals, and um, the main thing that they do is they are absolutely vigilant for stress, isolation, and boredom in their animals, and they, would n they never look at animals as, a, as individual, solitary beings. They always think about what is the social environment of this animal, what is its built environment, but mainly what is the social environment, because that kind of thing can cause the animal to have a lot of stress. So what they might do for something like a flank-biting stallion, for example, is to turn um, to take an isolated horse and to put him back into his more natural grouping to give him a herd. And often having a companion will see a decrease in these self-harming behaviors. Um, they also make sure that the animal has enough work to do, work. So horses, for example, spend about 20 hours of their day grazing. And um, if they're just given feed in a feed bag and they eat in five minutes, then they have nothing else to do with their their bodies for the rest of the day. So they try to have them um, eat throughout the day and give them something to do. Um, and sometimes they, if they can't give them a herd, they will give them a little, another little companion, like a chicken or a goat. And it's thought that just the, just the fear of stepping on that other, other animal, that other living thing, is enough to take the attention off itself, the, the social anxiety of isolation, and, um, and help it get better. Another topic that I looked at in my book is substance use and abuse. Um, so I was sort of interested to learn the extent of animals that uh, seek out and experience the effects of um, intoxicating substances. So in the southern United States, in Texas, and also in Australia, there's something called a cane toad. And this is a small frog that emits a sort of toxic sweat from its uh, pores. And many dogs have been seen to go seek out these cane toads, lick them, get high, is about the only way to describe it. They get glassy-eyed and they kind of roll around. Um, and then they want to do it again. There are stories of people who have these dogs who um, find themselves awake at 3 in the morning with the dog scratching at the door to get out to get its cane toad fix. And um, one woman said that she actually found herself down at the river looking for a toad to give to her dog so she could go back to sleep. So she was enabling this dog's behavior uh, so that she could get some rest. And then she found that the other neighbors didn't want their dogs playing with her dog because they were afraid that it what they would also learn this, um, this behavior. And that actually could happen because uh, in the Western US, there's something called loco weed, which is a kind of weed that cattle and horses and even wild animals eat, and then it makes them high, and then they eat more of it. It ends up having neurodegenerative effects, so ranchers can't stand it when their animals get into loco weed, and especially because they end up sort of teaching the rest of the group how to do it. And once you have a locoed animal in your herd, you have a big chance of other animals also figuring out how to use this weed and, and getting high with horrible effects. Um, this is a cedar waxwing bird. I think you have Scandinavian waxwings in this part of the world. Um, these birds are notorious for finding fermented berries, uh, gorging on them, and then flying wild drunk. Um, it is uh, sort of funny to think about, um, but what ends up happening is, is the same thing that happens when human beings drive drunk, which is that they um, fly into glass walls and glass buildings and end up um, getting internal injuries and broken beaks and broken backs and dying in big flocks because they're, um, 
because they're all intoxicated. The, the reason I bring this up is for a couple of reasons. One is just I think the biological basis of substance use and abuse is really, really, really important for psychologists and societies to be thinking about. Um, and the idea that other animals can also use and show the effects of intoxicants, I think, can give us a species spanning and perhaps even destigmatizing view of substance issues. Um, and then the other, the other reason I wanted to bring it up in this context is that in groups of animals, those animals will have different reactions to whatever the intoxicant is. So not every cedar waxwing is going to gorge and get drunk and fly drunk, um, and not every cattle in the western U.S. is going to um, eat loco weed and get high, but there are different um, propensities within groups um, to this happening. And then also there is uh, some interesting research on the earlier that animals use, the more likely they are to um, be open to it and seeking it later in their lives. Um, I want to talk for a minute about eating and nutrition and obesity. Um, a few months ago, if you'd asked me, do wild animals ever get fat? I would have said, of course they don't. They uh, are either chasing their food or running after it. They're getting plenty of exercise to catch their food. What they eat is all organic. It's probably um, salmon and blueberries and really healthy, healthy diets, organic greens and whole grains. They're not rolling up to a drive through and getting a, um, you know, a sundae or something. Um, but it turns out that in the wild, when there's uh, enough food, animals will overeat and they sometimes will get spectacularly overweight. Um, but a lesson comes from the natural world in um, the seasonality of the, um, of the abundance. So usually if, if a population of animals is getting bigger and bigger, the, um, the source of that will soon go away and um, the animals will slim back down again. Uh, again, I think that that's really useful for a group of um, clinicians and doctors and psychologists to be thinking about because if a vet sees a population of animals getting bigger, they're never going to say, you animal, you need to diet more and exercise and eat better and you need to figure out your own eating. They would say, what's going on in this environment, in this population's environment to make this happen? Um, and then the other thing that I think is very interesting is um, that, by the way, is a, um, an overweight tortoise that's gotten so big it can't go in and out of its shell. Um, these three here are uh, domesticated animals, so they, we humans are definitely more uh, implicit in, in their, um, their weight because we feed them and under-exercise them, but there is actually a parallel uh, obesity epidemic happening among wild animals too, which is really interesting to think about in terms of what might be going on environmentally to be affecting the um, body mass of different animals. This uh, dragonfly, um, I wrote about a metabolic syndrome in dragonflies that's actually related to a gut parasite. So the idea that um, our body weight can be affected by much, much more than just what's going on in our head, um, I think is is useful information to have. Um, in terms of groups and social stress, there's a very interesting um, thing that can happen to certain pigs during the very, very stressful time when they're going from um, being part of their litter from, uh, to being part of their herd. It's sort of pig adolescence, and it's um, really, really anxiety-provoking for these animals. And there are um, certain animals at some times that develop a self-starving syndrome that looks a lot like human anorexia nervosa. Um, you can see here on the end on the bottom picture that pig has what's called um, pig wasting syndrome. And it's much, much thinner than the rest of the pigs. It's stopped eating. And what pig experts have found is that there is a genetic substrate that, it, that it, these certain pigs have. They tend to be a little bit more anxious. Um, and what's also very interesting is that this is research that's coming out of Sweden. There may be a virus, too, that's affecting those certain pigs and causing um, this kind of multifactorial syndrome to be happening. Um, again, what I find most interesting about this is that 
uh, I've often thought of eating disorders as being all about body image and about the person. And uh, it seems like taking this more environmental group and social stress approach could be really useful to treating those. Um, there's also beluga whales and chimpanzees and other animals that develop, um, they force themselves to throw up. And that is um, kind of like human bulimia nervosa. It can spread among social groups um, where the animals are almost teaching each other how to do it. And that could be very upsetting for people to see and also um, really important for the vets to figure out what's going on in those animals' environment that's making them do this behavior in order to get relief from that. Um, this is fascinating new research that's coming out of uh, University of California at Davis. This is Dr. Madigan, who works with foals who have what he says is a pre, um, sort of proto-autism, um, a kind of horse autism. And what he has found is that uh, if he, that it happens in foals that are born either too quickly or born by cesarean. And his hypothesis is that there's um, a squeezing mechanism that happens during birth that essentially awakens the neurobiology of the foal and um, keeps it from getting this autism-like syndrome. Um, the, this, it, he, what he's noticed is that um, foals, if, when they're in utero, if they were to gallop, they would kill their mother. So there's a certain neurobiology and there's an endocrine aspect to it too that keeps the animals calm while they're in the womb and then they awaken during this birth process. And so he thinks that it's um, this delayed awakening that happens that can cause something like autism. I just think that that is fantastically hypothesis generating for human psychologists and psychiatrists who are studying autism and wondering where it might come from in human populations and thinking about ways of modeling it and treating it. And uh, these syndromes that I'm talking about, are they absolutely identical? Of course, of course not, because we are humans and we bring, with, uh, we, we bring our culture and our own um, form of evolution, and of course we're our own species too, that's what speciation is. But I think it's really, really important to put our behavior and um, psychology into context of other animals' evolution and the environments that we share. Uh, so quickly, um, Another thing we can learn from a veterinary approach is the extent to which we interact with things that we can't see every day, um, including pathogens, our microbiome, viruses. Um, this is a grasshopper, and it's been infected by a hair worm, which can only reproduce in water. So what this hair worm does is it gets into the brain of the grasshopper. It changes the neurochemistry of that grasshopper, which would normally not know, go near water. The grasshopper goes to the edge of the pool, jumps in, it dies, but the hair worm inside is allowed to you know, reproduce and live. This is actually stills from a video, which is really, really gory and kind of gross and exciting to watch. If you want to find it online, you can. I decided to spare you. But um, it's a really interesting way, again, human Depression and suicide is extremely complicated and extremely delicate and important topic. Um, but to expand the way we might model it and think about it um, by looking for other examples of an animal inexplicably taking its own life um, from other species, I think could, could be really useful f on the human side. Um, so I wanted to end by just reiterating that I know that we all have unique and beautiful psyches, of course, um, but much of human anxiety is linked to how we live with others. Uh, your patients are all going to be humans, of course, um, but interesting things can happen when you think about your human patients as human animal patients. Um, when you stop to take a species-spanning look at the forest and the meadows and the oceans and skies all around us, I think that you'll see that these animal groups contain important clues to individuals in human groups as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I, <laughs> I love it. Thank you.